everybody. Happy Boxing Day to anybody with a, a British background. And uh, I start counting the 12 days of Christmas because I'm one of the few people left who celebrates Epiphany, January 6th, because I always think it's cool to get to have an Epiphany. And in the interest of the season and the topic of our interview today, which I am so excited about, I just want to share my screen for a second. There is a teaching that during some of his so-called lost years, pardon all my uh, <laughs> background notes, but that Master Jesus spent some time in India and the, uh, the original of this image is in a, a monastery in the Himalayas. And what I just love about this image is that as he is meditating out in the forest, he's surrounded by animals, including animals that some people are afraid of and animals that some people disregard. But all that love coming from him is radiating out and kind of depicting for me that Isaiah prophecy and the world that we really want to have. Now, it is interestingly enough, this Jesus that cares so deeply about animals, who is the one discovered by our guest today, Keith Akers, in the extensive research that he did for two of his books, The Lost Religion of Jesus and Disciples, How Jewish Christianity Shaped Jesus and shattered the church. Welcome from Denver, Colorado, Keith Akers. Hi, Victoria. It's a pleasure hey. to be here. Well, it's wonderful to be with you. Oh, my goodness. We have known each other a really, really long time. And, you know, in some churches, they do kind of public confession during the service. So I'm going to do one of those. I am really upset that I only get 22 minutes to talk to this man <laughs> because he has so much to share. Keith, I could talk with you on this topic until next Christmas, but we've got 22 minutes. So let's start with why this became a passion of yours. You spent literally decades looking at the historical Jesus. What started that? Well, what started it was, first of all, I became a vegetarian, then I became a vegan, and I was raised as a Christian. So I said, oh, I wonder what, uh, uh, wonder what Christianity has to say about uh, religion, about animals and vegetarianism and, and things like that. And as you know, I wrote a book, a vegetarian source book, and one of the chapters in there is a chapter on Christianity. And this topic came up and I didn't know quite what to do with it because I found all these uh, things uh, in the New Testament that seemed actually to be rather antagonistic towards uh, vegetarianism. And uh, Paul says things like, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising any questions of conscience. Of course, questions of conscience is exactly what I wanted to do. So I started, decided to look into it further. So as you did, what did you start to see? Well, I saw a number of things. Uh, uh, the one thing I saw was a book that is totally obscure in which I think I'm probably the only one here that's even read it, possibly who's heard of it, called Jewish Christianity, Factional Disputes in the Early Church. And it was written by Hans Joachim Scherps who's a German Jewish scholar. And uh, he did all this research on uh, Jewish Christianity. And he said that vegetarianism was indeed a very important part of the early church. And so I started looking at uh, Jewish Christianity as a distinct thing, which I hadn't even uh, heard of previously. And this was the followers of Jesus who both identified as Jews and followed the law, the Jewish law as interpreted by Jesus and also followed Jesus as they, as they understood him. And they were vegetarians. And so I said, oh, well, this is, these are the people I need to look at. So give us a little background. There were groups of Jews who were vegetarian at the time of Jesus? Well, certainly, and, and the Jewish Christians were not the only ones. There was the, uh, the Essenes. There was probably a group called the Nazareans, which actually is the group that I believe Jesus actually directly uh, emerged from, uh, the, uh, and they were they were both vegetarians. They were all vegetarians, um, 
Uh, and the Essenes are described in uh, the Josephus and Philo and various of the church fathers, and they're described as, as vegetarians. The Nazareans are only found in Epiphanius and in all the literature surrounding Jewish Christianity. They're not, uh, it's not the same as Nazarenes. And this is a, this is a, a issue which comes up uh, a, another obscure point, which I got deeply into as I, uh, as I deepened my, my study. But the Nazareans were also uh, against animal sacrifice and were vegetarians. So talk with us a little bit about animal sacrifice. I was just rereading some parts of both your books today, and you state that really it was Jesus going into the temple and doing what he did that precipitated the crucifixion. So this was a big deal. Why do you think he was really there and what was he trying to do? Uh, well, the animal sacrifice business in Jerusalem was actually probably the key part of the economy. It was a big business. There were some archaeologists who did some uh, research. They looked at the bones of the animals. They found some of the bones that were sacrificed of the, of the animals that were sacrificed. And they came from all over the area. So it's like the local animals weren't enough. They had to actually bring in uh, animals for the, and especially at the Passover, uh, this would have been a huge increase in local business for, uh, for the Jerusalem temple. The temple in those days was nothing like a synagogue or a church or any kind of uh, religious place of worship, which we think of today. It was more like a butcher shop or a slaughterhouse, because this is where you brought the animals that you wanted to sacrifice and present to the, to the priests. So was this always a part of the tradition or was it inserted at some point? Well, uh, you asked me, I'd say it was inserted at some point. Uh, the, and of course, if you talk to uh, different scholars, you get different, get, different, uh, uh, get different interpretations. But I think the animal sacrifice business is, is something that came in, it was quite old, but it came, came in much, uh, uh, much later than, uh, than Moses, that's for sure. And they, but they had to put some of the, the, they had to put in all the instructions about animal sacrifice into, uh, into uh, Moses' instructions so that it would sound like it was really, really ancient. And this is the view that the Ebionites, the Ebionites were a Jewish Christian, the main Jewish Christian view, uh, main Jewish Christian group. And the Ebionites had this idea that there were false teachings inserted into the scripture. The scriptures were not just the word of God, pure and simple, uh, but were actually, actually had been uh, falsified. And so I think, of, no. no, go ahead. Yeah, and some of the falsifications, obviously the most important ones from the point of view of the Ebionites were specifically the instructions about animal sacrifice. So when most of us who went to Sunday school or catechism class, we had the idea that Jesus was just really not into capitalism. He went in there to overturn those money changers. He didn't like they were make, making the temple a, quote, den of thieves. But you have information that it was really a lot more about the sacrifice itself. Tell us about that and where that idea comes from. Well, you can get it straight out of the New Testament. Uh, I hear this is what John says, that Jesus' disruption of the animal sacrifice business is one of the few incidents that's in all four of the Gospels. And this is what it says in John. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. So certainly he was against capitalism, and he was trying he was to do something that was destructive to the economic order of the day. But that economic order was doing something very specific, namely, it was making money off the systematic slaughter uh, of animals as a religious observance. 
So your point is really good that he opposed animal sacrifice and you also offer a lot of historic data that he was not the only one. There were a lot of people and a lot of, of Jewish sects that opposed the uh, temple system and the animal sacrifice. But does that really go so far as to say that he also opposed eating meat and specifically what we always hear about eating fish? Yes. Well, the uh, the Ebionites were uh, very clear on this. They, they said, uh, we are vegetarians. We don't eat meat. Eating meat is same as worshiping demons. If you eat, then that fact that allows the demons to, uh, to take you over if you, you start eating meat and, and becoming engaged in all kinds of things of uh, manner of violence. Now, in the, in the early church, uh, there was a dispute between Paul and the other apostles James, Peter, and John over this very question as to whether uh, vegetarianism is part of the gospel message, whether vegetarianism is something uh, that uh, Christians should, should uh, participate in. And, uh, and in fact, the, the, the message from, uh, from, um, from James, at least, uh, who was a vegetarian, in fact, probably vegan, uh, was that yes, it's incompatible with Christianity to eat animals that were killed, whether they're sacrificed or not. And if you look at the letters of Paul, and this goes back to some of the, the verses that I found so troubling when I found out, uh, when I started, first started investigating this, like, uh, like um, when Paul says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, well, why is he talking about this? Why is he spending Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 talking about all this, anim all this business? It's because animal sacrifice and vegetarianism were very closely connected. And, if you're, and I think there's a practical reason why this is so. And that is the practical reason is that for most people who were vegetarian 99% of the time or vegan 99% of the time anyway, uh, the only real temptation to eat meat was at festival times, either pagan festivals when they sacrificed an oxen or at the Jewish festivals where at Passover when they, when they would uh, sacrifice animals. This was your big chance for the common person to, to, to eat meat. Uh, most people in the ancient world, except for the 1%, except for the very top, the very elite, they were the only ones who would even think about going in to a meat market to purchase meat. And Paul, when Paul says, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, really, he's talking to the 1%. He's not talking to the same people uh, that were in uh, Jesus' circle, the people that Jesus preached to, who are mostly the poor, uh, the oppressed, uh, the, the, the people in the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as it, it's put in the, in the Gospels. So, Keith, let's talk about this fish thing. I mean, we've all had Christian friends say that Jesus ate fish and a lot of the apostles were fishermen. So how far are we going to go with that one? Uh, yeah, as far as you want, I suppose. I'm not sure the rest of the, uh, I think 22 minutes probably wouldn't quite cut it. But the, the quick answer is that uh, these stories are probably later insertions. Most of them don't show Jesus eating fish at all. And they're, they're rather suspect uh, for other reasons as well. Fish is a very common symbol in early Christianity because the word fish in Greek, which is something like ixus, is an acronym that in Greek stands for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And people often spoke symbolically about fish in this way. I think uh, uh, Tertullian says that now when we're, uh, that, you know, that, that we little fishes uh, uh, want to become like our big fish, Jesus Christ, when we're baptized, uh, uh, it's, it's things like that. And uh, so I think it was probably uh, intended symbolically. And the very earliest versions of these fish stories are without fish. That, that the, when the, the, you see these same stories in the church fathers, in the early church fathers, the pre-Nicene fathers before the Council of Nicaea. And in these stories, uh, the, 
it only Jesus only distributes the bread to the 5,000. He, he, and the fish isn't there at all. In fact, Jesus at one point even himself refers in the gospel refers back and he says, don't you remember when I, uh, when I fed the fish, uh, when I, when I, excuse me, don't you remember when I fed the bread to the 5,000 and all the pieces that were picked up afterwards? He doesn't mention the fish. So I think the fish is clearly a later addition. That, that is so interesting. I know that uh, Rin Berry, the historian, said that when he translated the New Testament from the Greek, he found that the word in the story of the so-called loaves and fishes, that the word for fish was a different word. Instead of this regular word for fish, it was something that translated as either a spread like a relish or or desserts, third definition, little fishes. So I think of that as the miracle of the loaves and tahini. So you want to take a stab at the after the resurrection, somebody gave him a piece of fish? Uh, sure, I'll do that. Uh, the, the first thing is this, this, this uh, passage is clearly made up after the fact because it's directed against Markian. Markian was an early Christian heretic. He was a Gnostic. He believed that Jesus did not incar incarnate physically at all. He was never uh, he was never a physical body. He was just sort of a spirit or a ghost who moved around Palestine, uh, teaching people to be good or whatever. And <clears throat> so this passage is specifically directed at him. It's, it, it says that only after when the, he appears to the disciples and they still not don't believe, then he says you know, give me something to eat. And then he says, he says, no ghost uh, or spirit could take and eat something like this. Because in those days, it was believed that a spirit could not eat anything you would have. And so eating something would, uh, uh, would prove that Jesus was not a spirit. And in, in fact, this is almost certainly directed against Markian. It's, it specifically addresses his concerns this controversy doesn't even occur in the early church. Everybody knows that Jesus is a physical body. Uh, this wouldn't have even occurred to the first disciples or even to the first generation following, uh, following Jesus. It's some, Markian doesn't even, is born in the year 80. So this is very, very late. Fascinating. We have a couple of notes. Uh, Mark, and I believe this is Mark Bronstein, author of, of Radical Vegetarianism, says they stopped fishing, uh, meaning the apostles, I believe. And uh, Paula says, isn't the Aramaic word for fish and seaweed very similar? So thanks, thanks for those comments. So Keith, you spoke earlier about Jewish Christians, which is a phase that I'll bet most Christians and most Jews are not familiar with. So tell us about them and this movement. Uh, yes, uh, Jewish Christianity is a label which scholars have put on it. Uh, it's not a very good term and it has, okay, first of all, it has nothing to do with Jews for Jesus or anything like that. That's a modern, that's a modern movement which is actually totally different from uh, ancient Jewish Christianity, completely opposite. Uh, uh, but it, uh, uh, the main Jewish Christian group was the Ebionites, but there are also some other groups such as the Nazareans and the Ocenes and the Elkazaites. So they're various, and you could investigate those at, at great depth. They were all vegetarians. They were all vegetarians and believed that vegetarianism was part of their essential, uh, essential message. Uh, they followed Jesus but Jesus as an interpreter of the Jewish law, the, the law that casts out the, the false teachings in the, in the Old Testament. I see. And I just, uh, Mark has said it's Mark Sullivan. So Mark Sullivan, who did not write um, Radical Vegetarianism, but thank you so much yes. for the comment. So, These comments, by the way, are, are, are pretty, pretty accurate also. Great. Wonderful. Mark says, I had the privilege of communicating with Keith when he was writing Disciples. Very cool. So, yes. so uh, Keith, I, I have read about early Christians and some of the church fathers who were very definitely vegetarian. Do you have a sense of why this was so important to them? They had so much else to worry about being persecuted and fed to lions and whatnot. Why would they stick to this tenet as well? It just seems so beautiful, but so difficult for them. 
Yes. Well, they sp stuck to stuck to this tenet uh, because it was part of their 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 uh, religion. Uh, most people in the early church were vegetarians. They didn't think about why. The controversy about Paul in, only comes in when it starts branching out into the upper classes of Rome. And this is one of the reasons Ro uh, Christianity was successful was it when it went into the upper classes. And the question is whether it should be required. But uh, Augustine, who's not a vegetarian, uh, remarks in the fifth century that uh, the number of vegetarian uh, Christians who are vegetarian is without number, meaning Orthodox Christians uh, is without number. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Ebionites were entirely, entirely vegetarian. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of consonant also with the idea of the poor, because the one teaching of Jesus, which does seem to be accurately represented in early Christianity, is the teachings towards the poor, which comes down even to the present day. And this is what the poor were eating. They were eating vegetarian. Uh, almost everyone uh, who was in the lower and the, even the middle classes of ancient Rome, to, to the extent that there were middle classes, uh, was vegetarian just because there wasn't very much meat. Uh, available in the first place, and not only for the rich. Yes. So we're we're getting down under the wire. Um, Paula has asked, and if you could answer this quickly, because I have one more question too. Uh, if you think that the gospel of the Holy Twelve is authentic, uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's a uh, this is a this is a later development. I've forgotten. There's all there's a whole bunch of of modern sort of gospels. Uh, that were developed. And I, actually, some of it is probably is hodgepodge uh, taken from the New Testament. So that part might be. But, uh, but generally, uh, no. And I can, you can look at my blog. I've written a couple of blogs on this on my website where I discuss this in some detail. But I think it's from mostly from the 19th or early 20th century. And what is your blog, Keith, so people can find you? Oh, it's CompassionateSpirit.com. And it's just like it sounds. Compassionate Spirit, all one word, dot Calm. Beautiful. And the question that I was going to ask you that you probably don't have time to answer because we have a minute and a few seconds left, but maybe we could address this in our breakout rooms later and hopefully some lucky people will be in a breakout room with you. And that is what we do now. What we who either are Christian or know a lot of Christians, how, how we explain why our veganism is compatible with that belief. So actually, we do have 40 seconds. You want to give it 40 seconds? Uh, in 40 seconds, I say that this is a problem. It's a $64,000 question or probably $64 million. Uh, and I don't have the answer. Uh, <laughs> I've not been able to find any group within Christianity that really, uh, I, I, that really, really gives voice to my concerns. Uh, they'll tolerate my vegetarianism, but they don't really get that it's part, I think that it's part of the gospel message. And so that's one reason why I think the Compassion Consortium is, is such a wonderful group because people who still sort of have a, a, a soft spot in their heart for Jesus, but you know, can't handle Christianity, which is basically me, uh, that you can have some place to go. That is beautiful. And it is exactly 22 minutes, which is a Christmas miracle. 